Hello. I hope you're having a great time at OlliCon. I am honored you've chosen to spend your time with me today. I'm excited to share what I learned putting 200 developers on call. First, a little about me. My name is Alina. I'm a senior technical program manager at Outreach. You can find me online in all the usual places. Let's be honest, 2020 was truly a dumpster fire. I chose to commemorate this by deciding at the very last minute to learn to cross stitch Christmas gifts for my family. As long as you don't look at the back, I totally nailed it. In 2021, I'm also trying something new, giving this talk. I hope you can find at least one idea that gives you hope or inspiration for whatever situation you may find yourself in today. Feel free to reach out and say hello in the Honeycomb Slack community. I'll be there hanging out this week. Let's jump right in to 10 lessons in 10 minutes. An on-call is a human, not a robot. Humans are complicated, messy, and susceptible to emotional, physical, or social influences. Each on-call engineer handles stress and learning differently. It's super important to accept this natural variance. It is unrealistic to expect humans to perform manual tasks perfectly and consistently. Humans require compassion and connection. Service level objectives, or SLOs, are an easily understandable language that helps humans operate systems more effectively. You're not alone. Leverage relationships. Most, if not all of us at OlliCon today, are grappling with new challenges at work. When it comes to reliability, we're navigating a complex ecosystem within our organizations that often requires orchestration of people, processes, and technologies. I wanna encourage you to leverage your network of vendor relationships. You and your vendors share the same goal. You want your team and business to be successful. Partner with your vendors to conduct engineer training sessions, host office hours, or even facilitate strategy deep dives. Through a conference like this, Slack interest group, or vendor intro, take the opportunity to connect with leaders at other companies and share ideas. And sometimes you just need to remember you're not alone in this. The obvious is not obvious. A close colleague has challenged me to fully accept this lesson and is now a standing joke between us when anyone says, but that was obvious. The obvious is truly not obvious. What seems plain as day to you can be entirely overlooked by the person next to you to no fault of theirs. Just ask the question or say the thing. Especially under pressure, under pressure in incident situations, our brains are in overdrive and a simple reminder can help us all. All it takes is one brave person to think something might be obvious, but to ask the question anyway. Like asking an incident commander, what is the customer impact here? In this scenario, it could be the reminder everyone needs that it's already been a half hour and we haven't even answered the most single important question. Make learning and growth visible. Building and operating reliable cloud services is an exhilarating and at times head spinning journey of continuous learning. Learning and growth is a practice, a commitment to practice that must be visible across teams and leaders. This can look like an open door policy for participating in postmortems, allowing interested engineers to contribute to a given retrospective. It can be highly valuable to create a forum for lessons learned authors to share their findings and insights with the broader organization. Cherish the opportunity to listen. Change is hard. Sometimes complaints are just a request to be heard or seen, and it's not something to fix resulting in an action item. On-call rotations can create stress and tension for anyone, especially for the first time. 
Cherish the opportunity to listen for what is causing fear, uncertainty, friction, or struggle, and validate the human who is taking the time to express it. We can't always solve all of our on-call problems, but we can listen, and sometimes that is enough. Say what they need to hear. Leadership needs to hear the truth. They need information to make decisions. They are charting our course ahead. Engineers need to hear what to expect and what is expected of them. Sometimes we wince a little, knowing it will be a little uncomfortable. It helps no one when we downplay or soften something and it never gets fixed. You can use SLOs as a tool to speak the truth and provide direct visibility to leadership. Embrace the art of the broken record. When you think you've said it too many times, say it one more time. Say it verbally, say it in writing, say it in Slack, say it in Zoom, say it in the org-wide meeting, say it in the wiki, just keep saying it. Embrace being an annoying broken record about things that matter. Everyone is facing information overload from all directions. Assume no one read it the first or the second time. Ask, what is the customer impact every single time until the team develops the muscle to consider this before you even have to ask? Praise proactive homework. It can be difficult to gain visibility of work that prevents issues. So often the firefighting can take center stage. Cultivate opportunities to recognize proactive work. It can look like quietly working to make the next on-call shift more successful by implementing a weekly handoff mechanism, methodically updating SLO docs, eliminating noisy alerts that weren't actionable, or even running a game day for the team. Recognizing proactive instead of hero worship builds sustainable engineering culture. Assume training is never enough. Great knowledge base, great diagram, onboarding session, they're ready, right? No, not even close. Assume no one read your doc and they were texting during Zoom training, or they forgot everything since their last on-call shift eight weeks ago. DevOps teams and orgs are moving incredibly fast. It is impossible to keep up with all the documentation and training. Continuous feedback loops weekly or daily via on-call handoffs can keep the whole team up to date on new changes to be aware of. Trust your struggle. Some days it can feel too hard and other days it can feel hopeful. This is the human experience, the human struggle. At Olicon, we are part of an evolution within the software industry. So many organizations are faced with the same challenges. We can learn from each other. We are defining the next generation of tools and corporate culture. Know that you are doing some hard stuff. In 10 minutes, we walk through 10 le lessons I learned putting 200 developers on call. Thank you for sharing this time with me. I hope you're taking at least one idea that will start a conversation when you get back to your team. And thank you to all the awesome humans that made this possible. If you have feedback on how I can make my presentations more accessible or inclusive, I would love to hear from you and hope to meet you in Slack. Thank you very much. Uh, before we dive in, just a reminder to the crowd that we will, of course, be taking questions in the obnoxiously longly named Slack channel. But the first question comes from me because that's why I put myself in these positions where I can ask the important stuff. And it comes down to the, the baseline question of when you put people on call who until now have not been on call, how do you handle the... I guess real, I want to say perceived, it's not, it's real, uh, shift in expectations where it, it used to be a nine to five job or these are developers, let's not kid ourselves. Often it's 10 to four or 10 to midnight, depending on what's broken and, and shift that over to, oh, by the way, your sleep schedule. Yeah, fun story. It, it feels for folks who have not been in an on-call environment previously or took the role because at the time it wasn't on-call, that it's mm -hmm. a shifting of expectations. How do you handle that? 
Yeah, it absolutely is a shift. And it's a shift not only for the engineer, but for their family, right? For their lifestyle, for um, their time away from work. And I think that it is, you're not going to be successful unless leadership is aligned on what that means to the culture and what the messaging is to the engineers. And I think the reality is you can't make that shift without a certain amount of attrition. Um, some people are going to take, it's a fork in the road and some people are going to say, hey, this isn't for me. Um, and so I think sometimes there's a lot of frank conversations with leadership and as a TPM, um, sometimes what I can do is anonymize feedback and present that to them in a way that's like, hey, we're getting feedback around this set of challenges. What is our plan to address it? Yeah, I, I think it's also very fair if someone decides, well, I signed up because there was no on-call. Now there is the expectations change. I'm going to go work somewhere else. And if I were to hear someone tell me that story in a job interview that I'm considering hiring them for, it wouldn't be a ding against them, even if Absolutely. it were an on-call role. Because changing expectations versus having an expectation is slightly different. Uh, right. How do you tend to view the the approach of compensating people for being on-call in those scenarios? Yeah, this like is in the abstract, I yeah. love it. On the other, it's there's a model unit economics we're trying to maintain here. Yeah, that's a great question. And this also um, has comes up. And I think HR has to be enrolled in what's going on. They have to understand what the kind of company perspective is on this. Some organizations out there offer different types of compensation. Other organizations do not. Um, and I think a more successful transition means that engineering leadership and HR is on the same page about what the messaging is for folks. Um, you know, whether it's device related, time related, certain regional um, areas around the globe actually have laws around on call and um, compensation. I, I want to display my own bias here. I, my, my first on call job was so horrific. I would say at this point it qualifies as abusive uh that it was that it was ridiculous there was a 15 minute sla and uh two people left the team one of them transferred the other person was well i'm the, i'm the managing the team so i'm always on call so i'm not part of the rotation and it went from one week out of four to a full-on 50 percent rotation at which point it, it you consider it as best effort and it, that, that was during the 2008 financial crisis and that has really set me in a direction of i don't want to be on call because that's that's awful and it feels like completely ruin your quality of life. Uh, one thing that I think companies get wrong is if you're woken up by something, you are empowered to fix that thing, Absolutely. whatever it is. And sometimes that fix is turning off the alert that would have woken you up because as well, if all I have to do is go open a ticket with someone else and wait for them to fix it, great, make them on call, which is sort of the entire point of what you're getting at. Mm -hmm. This old world of just the ops people are on call and then yep. they can tag in people as needed. It, right. if you, it seems that improving software quality, it, please correct me if I'm wrong on this, feels like it's a shortcut to this because all you're doing is making the people who write the software have to feel the consequences of that software not doing what it's supposed to do in a more visceral way. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And almost um, not transitioning from the culture of let's make it boring and let's all work you know, normal lives and we don't have heroes that are kind of running in to save the day or we don't have, um, you know, there's a certain, I mean, I'm, I consider myself an ops person and, um, you know, there's a certain fun, excitement, adrenaline, right? When you guys are working on a problem or, um, so, so I think there's a lot of interesting human factors involved, but to your point around fixing the problem, like every on-call handoff or every week, look at, and pager duty as an example is one tool that allows you to see when you got paged, how many are after hours and go through every single one. And it's like, was this actionable? Yes or no. Was this, can this be automated? Yes or no. Did someone really have to get up for this? Yes or no. Um, and being really vigilant about that. And I think the team culture, not just saying, oh, it's okay, just eat the pain and suck it up, um, ultimately isn't a place most of us want to work. Uh question for me on this one. If, did you find challenges in driving for that culture of on-call when presumably, please correct me if I'm wrong, as a senior TPM, 
you were not part of the on-call rotation yourself. Doesn't it sound like, hey, yeah, you assholes need to wake up more. By the way, wake up, asshole, is the pager duty motto. They just don't realize it yet. Uh, I'll be sleeping sound as anything until morning when I go to work. Like it, it feels like it's one of those, the people who always seem to be forcing you to take an on-call rotation yep. are invariably never the people who are on that rotation themselves. Yep. I, I agree that that pattern is not the way you want to go. And, you know, despite, um, despite people, you know, suggesting that I should handle it that way, the, what we chose to do was our, we rolled out an incident commander program. All of the engineering leadership was on call. So they had a 24 hour primary, 24 hour secondary uh, on call for incident commander. And so CTO, directors, VPs were all participating in this rotation. And I was shadowing for the, all the incident commanders. So every time we got declared incident, I was paged in as well. Um, and this was essentially to observe and make sure that we were, um, how we were doing, where the gaps were, what we needed to address. Um, and until we got to a point where things were running relatively smoothly and I was no longer needed um, and uh, could just kind of step back. So, so I think anyone that's driving there, there isn't a world in which there are people who are telling you you need to do this that are not don't have skin in the game. Um, it just, I, I don't, I think it comes down to values um, and being directed from the ivory tower to impact your life is not, doesn't feel very good. Ben asks, if, if on call is a tire fire, it invariably is. Uh, do you fix it before adding devs so they can come into their on-call experience uh, knowing that it doesn't have to suck? Or do you bring them into the rotation in order to help calm the firestorm of Bernie pain? I think somewhat a strong engineer, it's it's bringing visibility because sometimes what can, what can happen is after that first on-call, you write like a summary of everything that you had and you have a come to Jesus with the product manager and say, look, we are stopping all feature work for two sprints because we're going to go fix these things and introduce this automation. Um, and sometimes that's just what you have to do because, um, and so it's like surfacing that information and then making a stand that this is not sustainable. Um, and it's actually impacting our velocity because at the end of the day, the business wants revenue driving you know, features and stuff. So if, and if you have an on-call like that, that is going to be a direct conflict to being able to produce that value. In the noblest tradition of company earnings calls, when analysts are, are uh, called upon to ask a single question and then they come back with two, Sean Horn says, here are two questions. First one, uh, how do we do this messaging in a positive manner without being labeled by the powers that be as the squeaky wheel? Like in a startup, no one wants to hear this. They just want the duct tape. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, in my experience, abstracting it away from like an individual person's opinion and making it like um, like a guild or a working group or a um, kind of like a community driven folk that produces a summary or a report or an insight and that can bring all the same points, but you no longer have the objection that it's like, oh, it's Bob's opinion and Bob is always opinionated. And um, you you make it more of like a, I guess a, a white paper in a sense, or like a published document of the current state of things. And then a proposal of like how we mitigate these things. And the second part of the question, because of course no one follows the truck, more people are doing it too. I shouldn't have said anything. Uh, how do we know when it's time to give up? I mean, do we ever? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do. I think give up when someone else offers to pay me more. And then my solution out is the, here's my two week notice. No, yep. you can't offer me a counter. Yeah. But and that, I, that is a bit of a defeatist slash mercenary attitude. Right. Yeah. And I, I've had seen some cool writing um, on the internet these days about, you know, when giving up is actually a positive thing. And I do think if your organization is going through this, everyone should soul search and figure out what are my values? Do I enjoy this work? Is, am I invested in this? Is this aligned with my career aspirations? Um, and sometimes it's not. And instead of suffering for the next six months to a year, um, it might make sense to make a, 
a shift. Um, in terms of giving up on the overall um, initiative, I think at the end of the day, I think you can just boil it down to, is our company fulfilling the promise we are making to our customers? And that's sort of a yes or no. Like if we have said we are going to be available for three nines, are we meeting that or not? Um, and if you are meeting that and you don't have, you know, I think it comes back to, are you getting the velocity that you want? Yes or no? Are you meeting the promises? Yes or no? And if those things are true, then I think you have to dig a little bit more in to, well, what problem are we trying to solve? Next we have from Brandon Vincent. How do you approach a long and growing backlog of on-call sourced bugs? You're right. Always time to patch something, just to get it back up. Never time to fix it properly. Yeah. I think what I've seen effective there is having a, um, a pre-agreed upon just basic priority matrix around severity and you know you guys can debate it indefinitely for priority versus severity versus urgency and at the end of the day there's going to be a bucket of things that you just don't fix um, and so I think sometimes there's ruthless prioritization in there and maybe you just publish a known issues list and um, it has to reach a certain threshold of you know, a customer report or two customer reports before it comes off the known issue and becomes something that you take action on. Um, but it's, you know, having some kind of systemic prioritization and it's super uncomfortable to say, we're not gonna go fix these things, right? Like that's not, it's not enjoyable, but that's the reality. Not enjoyable, but the reality that that really feels like work in many respects. Uh, Chris Lasher <laughs> asks, uh, I'm a also trying to do two questions at once, but I'll try and condense them into one because, you know, why not? Engagement is what we want from audience members here. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, I'm a fan of Dominica de Grandis' Making Work Visible, but today's I've, this is the first time I've heard making learning visible, and I love the phrase. Uh, what are some ways you found to make learning visible, and, and do you use different ways tailored to different audiences? I think on this specific topic post postmortems is a really like key and and rich opportunity for learning and i think part of that is calling out if, if you know writing a postmortem for someone can feel like this like really tedious administrative task that um, isn't necessarily connected with the value that it could drive across the org so calling out hey as part of that maybe a bullet point or two of what lessons did you learn that could apply that all the teams could benefit from. And then if you have some forum, some companies, it's like a big meeting, or Zoom meeting, some it's like a wiki published place where um, the listeners, you know, main tune out for some of like the details, but then for that part of, oh, hey, this is a section that might be relevant to me and lessons I can learn here. Um, and so you sort of create that structure for focus that works really well um, because you have so much input and you're not going to sit there and retain every detail of every postmortem. But if you're highlighting, hey, we had this outage because of the certificate expiration. Um, hey, like here's a learning and everyone should go back to their teams and think about how you're handling certificate expirations as an example. I think one of the hardest parts as well is, is, is understanding who the different constituencies are and how this stuff all works out. So I guess it's it's in a microcosm to say, here's how you wind up uh, driving this out and rolling adoption of it. But as you did this, did the organization as a whole learn things it didn't know? about the not i don't want to talk about politics necessarily but the yeah. idea of like the way that information is flowing the way that things are construed inside of the environment that's huge that's huge and i think things have to be discoverable so one example um is like standard slack naming conventions where there's people don't have to look up a wiki and ask a guy who knows a guy to go find the channel for a specific team. There's like a standard kind of team API interface, I guess, in a sense where you all you need to know is, hey, if I search for a keyword, I'm going to be able to find a expected interface for a team, whether it's Slack channel, you know, intake form, that kind of thing. Um, because people are going to reorg, people are going to leave the company, you're never going to know who is in charge of what anymore. Um, so you sort of have to create these durable um, things that people can still interact with and, and eventually 
find what they're looking for regardless of the org changes and shifts. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question here. Uh, making develop from Ezra, from Ezra, Ezra Stevens, my God, can't speak anymore. Making developers responsible for their own services can mean breaking one rotation into several. How do you apportion responsibility for each team fairly? It's a great question. Well, that team has four people on it and the other one has 14. How do you make sure that it's that uh, basically transferring to larger teams does not become a uh, perverse incentive? Um, I tend to think about this in terms of looking at the services first. So if you have service A, B, and C, okay, great. What resources does service A need to be maintained and develop new features? Okay, great. We think that's, you know, six people. And then obviously that service needs to go to a team with six or more people. Um, and uh, I think it's, I don't think it's successful to try to shoehorn services on a list on a spreadsheet into the teams. It's like, okay, what does this service need in order to operate and meet the commitments? And then we should resource that. Um, and sometimes that results in we need to hire more people or we need to mix things up because one service might have this like massive monolithic database. And so you need a certain skill set. Um, and so you might need to shuffle seats a little bit to make sure that that service has the right expertise needed in order to operate it. Well, thank you very much for giving your talk. This is one of those areas that I think everyone has loud, angry opinions on, but you have yeah. not just data, but also experience reports, which is great to hear. And it seems, to, at least in your case, to come from a place slightly different from, I don't want to be on call, therefore it's bad putting me on call, which frankly, I'm very sympathetic to and hold myself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elena. There will, of course, be further yeah. questions for people to hurl questions at you in the on the other side. Absolutely. In the Slack channel. Thank which people you so should much. Be in. Well, thank you. Appreciate it.